You're listening to Pitch Perfect, the podcast, not the movie. And I'm your host, Nate. And joining me is my co-host, the writer and director of A Talking Cat. Don't look that up. His name's Josh. Yes, hi. Welcome to Pitch Perfect, and welcome to this season. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. The AIM famous hero is now the man of the hour. Ernest P. Worrell. The best to be in a position to use his amazing powers in a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. Ernest has assumed the disguise of a mild-mannered plumber with lofty goals of being a camp counselor. That's right. Welcome to The Importance of Being Ernest, where my co-host and I will talk about Ernest's incredible legacy and how things might have been different if our dear hero Jim Varney hadn't returned to his home planet so soon. Yes, this is the first season of Pitch Perfect, and we're going to watch and analyze each and every film in the Ernest franchise to see what we can learn about what is essential, or in fact important, about being Ernest. So at the end of the season, we can pitch the perfect Ernest movie. That is correct. And uh, we start off with uh, the most glorious of movies. Ernest goes to camp. Yes. This is the first proper Ernest feature film. It's not the first appearance of the character. Uh, Do you want to talk a little bit about the real life backstory behind the concept of Ernest B. Worrell? Yeah, by all means. So... It's an interesting phenomenon, because I really can't think of another thing that's like this. He's a character created for commercials, but he's not, like, the specific spokesman of a specific product. You know, like, the Geico Cavemen are the Geico Cavemen. It would be really fucking weird if the Geico Cavemen showed up and did, like, a commercial for Ragu, right? Correct. But Ernest was created and then did commercials for, like, a bunch of totally unrelated products and companies. He was just the uh, altogether character that would show up and try to sell you something. Yeah. Uh, And that character got really popular, and eventually they decided to make movies about him. Now, before Ernest goes to camp, there's a film called Dr. Otto something, and the Riddle of the Gloom Beam, which is sort of a... It's like a general showcase for Jim Varney, and one of the characters he does in it is Ernest, but it is not about Ernest. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, before he got into movies, there was a TV series that did not last very long uh, called Hey Vern, where he would hang out with his friend Vern and have wacky adventures. Yeah, so the format of the commercials was always that he would say, Hey Vern, that was like his catchphrase at the beginning of the uh of the commercial and then he would talk to the camera like you the viewer were Vern. And he I mean aren't we all off. deep down Vern? No. I am not Vern. It's sad that you feel that way. I hope you change your mind. And the Hey Vern thing gets carried over into some of the movies, but not all of them. It's like This is true. Nodded to in Ernest Goes to Camp, but I don't think it's even directly referenced. Well, it is semi-referenced by a couple of characters appearing in uh, the movie that we could talk about a little bit later. Uh, but it is specifically like referenced and actually a part of the movie later on in the Christmas movie. That yeah, Ernest the Christmas does, movie like. has a, directly just has a Hey Vern bit in the middle. Mm-hmm. Not even in the middle, like in the beginning of that movie. But other times it doesn't come up at all. I think like, we'll see as we talk about the other movies. We can, we, we can maybe have a little bit of a Vern Watch 2020. We don't ever see Vern. That's the thing. It's important that Vern no, is always... because we're Vern. Yeah. Well, the camera's Vern, at least. If we see Vern, it'd be like being sucked into a black hole, meeting your future self. It'd be over. Yeah, it was like, well, they did the first screening of the first Ernest commercial in that theater. Everyone got scared because they thought that they were Vern and then the train was going to hit them. All right, so let's get into the podcast proper and stop fucking around with context. There's other podcasts that people can listen to if they want to hear people talk about context. We're here for the meat of the matter and figure out what the fuck makes Ernest tick. What makes Ernest Ernest? And how can we ourselves become Ernest? Would you... Okay, if um, Frank Langella from that hit movie The Box... 
showed up at your house and offered you a box with a button on it that would turn you into Ernest, would you push it? Is that the only stipulation? I wouldn't get a million dollars if I oh, turned well, into Ernest? <laughs> you turn into Ernest, but a random person dies. <laughs> See, I don't know if I would take that, because if I was Ernest, I know Ernest wouldn't take it, unless he was somehow bamboozled into doing it. Yeah, well, I don't. Ernest wouldn't push a button that makes him into himself. He's already himself. He would by accident. Yeah, he would definitely do it by accident. He would, like, fall on his butt on top of the button and then become double Ernest. <laughs> That'd be a great movie. We should make that movie. Yeah, maybe that'll be our pitch. Write, write that down in your notes. Just to be clear for people, the way the podcast works is, once we're done watching all the movies in whatever category the season is about, in this case, it happens to be Ernest, then we're going to do an extra episode where we pitch our version of the perfect whatever movie using that, uh, with the knowledge we gleaned from our survey. Uh, so we could very much pitch to Ernest Goes to Double Ernest <laughs> as our movie. Uh, it would, I don't know why that would be the perfect Ernest movie, but it might be. That's right, folks. If you want to stick around and hear sexy voices talk about the next 10 Ernest movies, you'll get a special treat at the end where we talk about the Ernest movie that could be and use our wonderful brains to make something that will titillate the senses. Hopefully. Sure. Let's talk about what happens when Ernest goes to camp. Yes. Uh, uh, he goes to camp. Foremost. Episode over. I'll catch you next week, everybody. Have a good one. <laughs> now, why don't you give them the synopsis? So Ernest Goes to Camp is set at Camp Kikakee, where Ernest is, well, you call him Plumber, and I think he's just like a general handyman there. Perhaps. He starts the movie off just plunging the toilet and making that classic ew noise yeah. in the face that he's known for. Yeah, sort of his 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 his, his trademarks are uh, that thing that he does. Hey, Vern, and you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, he it starts with a protracted bit of, like, toilet slapstick, which I loved as a kid. Talking to a camera about his dreams and desires about being a camp counselor and being respected. Yeah, there's a fair amount of him breaking the fourth wall and pulling... And that's not quite a Ferris Bueller, because time... Does time stop in Ferris Bueller? Is that just Saved by the Bell that I'm thinking of? That's Saved by the Bell. Well, um, seems to go on in Ferris Bueller, but who knows? As far as the internet's concerned, Ferris himself doesn't even exist. It's all in Cameron's brain. Mm -hmm. So Ernest has a Deadpool-like ability to address the camera sometimes, but he does not seem to be fully aware that he's a character in a movie, and he doesn't have any power over time and space. That so we th know of. Those are all important things that we, that we have learned. Yeah, so he's a handyman or a plumber or something. He drives a bus at one point at this camp, uh, which is a summer camp, and it's, he dreams of being a camp counselor. That's his ambition, is to, to rise from whatever his position is currently to the position of camp counselor. Uh, also, while this is going on, there is a um, mining company that wants to get the land that the camp is on, which is not owned by the camp, but is in fact owned by... An elderly Native American man who leases the land to the camp, I guess? Uh, from our understanding of the movie, with the forward in the beginning, well, not forward, uh, the flashback in the beginning, that this area used to be an ancient Indian settlement. And now yeah. it's become Camp Kikagee and honors the ancient Indian settlement that lived there, or the grandfather is from that tribe and uh, has just owned the land throughout. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think he's supposed to. Yeah, that's. The, I definitely think he's supposed to be part of the tribe that previously controlled the land and who are, whose ritual is shown in the opening of this movie. This movie's a little bit structurally ambitious. It just start with a, a sequence that takes place like a hundred years ago or whatever or more, and then cut to Ernest doing toilet slapstick, which is very powerful. Yeah, so he wants to be a camp counselor. This guy owns the land. This mining dude wants the land to mine a... Uh, did you write down the name of the mineral? Because it's like... it's like, For all intents and purposes, it's Unobtainium. It has a g -g goofy fake name, like Unobtainium, but I forgot to write it down. I think it's like Parasite or something like that. I remember it kind of sounding like Pesticide. Anyway, he's trying to get the they land from this dude. They want to mine Pesticide from that land. 
Mm-hmm. The chief walks off the land, uh, and the mining guy is initially uh, stymied in his attempts to acquire the land. Also, while this is happening, the camp has a second chances program where they let children from uh, baby jail get released from baby jail uh, and go to the camp for free, provided that they keep up their good behavior. And Ernest is sent to pick up these kids, and then they're assigned to a regular camp counselor who they get in a confrontation with and break his leg in a lake. (laughs) Yep. And Ernest is then finally gets his wish to be a camp counselor, but he has to watch after these bad kids. And then a long stretch They basically set up to fail. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it's like nobody wants the job, so they pawn it off on Ernest, and he's so earnest about being a camp counselor that uh, he's willing to take this job that nobody else wants. And he puts his heart and soul into it, and we get a long sequence of Ernest bonding with the kids and them pranking him, and lots of 90s-style hijinks ensue. And then, eventually, the kids sort of get into the spirit of the camp, and they decide they're going to make a teepee to win this, like, camp contest? That, for some reason, they basically decide if they win the contest, they won't have to go back to baby jail. But it's never really explained how they come to that conclusion or why they would come to that conclusion. Right? Right. Uh, and then they're, the bullies sabotage their their uh, their teepee that they're making, which like brings us to a dark moment in the second act. But the other dark moment that happens in the second act is Ernest is basically tricked into helping... The mining guy trick the chief into selling the camp. Then everyone gets evicted. Ernest and the kids come together and they launch a guerrilla assault on the mining encampment and win back the camp. And that's the end of the movie. Yep. And Ernest becomes a camp counselor for good. Uh, And he's also an immortal god. And uh, then also uh, the kids stay there forever i think i guess very unclear what the state of the kids is you and i were watching this movie together um that's a little behind the scenes tidbit for everybody we watched the movie together uh and at the end you you and i were both like is Ernest their dad now is he their (laughs) legal guardian do they live at the camp Ernest lives at the camp but does he only live at the camp during the summer it's not implied yeah I have no idea what the situation at the end... Like, is the summer going to end and they're just going to go off to baby jail and Ernest is going to go be, like, a carny or something? Like, that just as easily could have been the ending, given how much information we're giving about everybody's status at the end of the movie. Look, for all intents and purposes, it ends on a happy note. Let's not ruin it by looking too far to the future and seeing the sun exploding and everybody but, dying. But we know, because we're doing a whole series about this, that Ernest... He does not stay at camp. He saves Christmas. He goes to jail. He's scared stupid. He rides again. He goes to school. He goes to Africa. And he goes to to army. Also basketball. Also, he, yeah, also he goes to basketball. So we, <laughs> we know he doesn't stay at the camp. What, is, what, is, what becomes of the kids is my question. Or we're never going to get an answer. Well, I don't know. Uh, do you want to talk about how Ernest is immortal? Because I think that's an important thing that I didn't really mention in my synopsis. Well, let's get to that in a second. First and foremost, let's uh, rate the movie. Uh, just as like a whole. So, from my perspective, I typically do like out of 10. Uh, and I think it's like a 6 out of 10. You know, it's not uh, a bad movie. It's an enjoyable, fun, goofy movie. Uh, but, you know, perhaps it's not really fully realized and it is a little bit messy. I would probably... I'm inclined to give it a 6 as well. Here, here's the thing. I don't think there's, like... There isn't really a part of this movie, like, a, a, a actual section of chronological time in this movie where I would be like, that's the bad part. There is one element that's quite bad. And there are lots of jokes that don't really work and, like, the plot's not amazing or whatever... But there's really no, like, point of this movie where, where I am thinking to myself, wow, this fucking sucks. Like, that doesn't happen. And there are a fair amount of points in the movie where I'm like, that's great. I love that. So, I think that evens out to a six. To, like, okay. a good movie. But the the Native American stuff is really rough. It sure is. 
Uh, and uh, there are a bunch of incidents of stereotypes occurring. Uh, a lot of kids without shirts. There are lots uh, of kids without shirts. I don't know actually know if that's a huge problem with the movie. Would I prefer it, that they wear shirts? Sure, absolutely. Would I prefer 100%. to not have to think about people swimming in jean shorts? Yes. But that's not the world we live in. This movie has people swimming in jean shorts, and I have to think about the horrible rash they're going to get. Uh, so let's um, dive into that. So we got the, uh, the low points of the movie, kind of talked a little bit about that. The biggest low point for me, uh, which I'm sure you'll agree, is when Ernest is uh, getting a shot. Uh, mm-hmm. We're not specified what he's getting a shot for, but apparently he has to get a shot before he sees the kids. I'm guessing it's a flu shot. Anyway. It's weird that it's uh, happening in the summer, though. For sure. So, Ernest, uh, scared of needles. Poor guy. You know, relatable. Mm-hmm. And uh, as things are going, he's trying to be a man, trying to prep himself up, and the kindly nurse, who's also related to the uh, grandfather Indian, uh, of the Kikiki tribe? Is that... I don't know. I mean, the camp is called KKK. I think they're the KKK tribe. Yeah, they are. Because at one point, Ernest is, talks about how he learned the KKK sign language, which is how he communicates with the chief, which is how he ends up accidentally helping the mining guy buy the land. So she's related, and she's involved with that. But anyway, uh, he preps himself up, and then at the end of it, as he's like, uh, about to ha- receive the needle, one of the things that he's shouting out, which is just random sputterances, is, I am Joseph Mangala. He admits that he is he, Joseph Mangala. He's, first, he admits to stealing the Lindbergh baby. He says, I yes. stole the Lindbergh baby, and then he screams, I am Joseph Mangala. Which is... Weird. What is what is that? Why is that? That's well, bad. That's very bad. I guess the bit... I mean, the bit is, right, that he's being tortured, and... Under torture, people often confess to crimes they didn't commit. I guess? That's the joke? It's a bad joke. Yeah, it's a bad joke. Him being afraid of needles is weird, except for the fact that, like you said, it it makes him relatable to kids specifically. Because I think a big part of Ernest's character, at least in this movie, and we'll see how it continues across the, uh, the span of the Ernest franchise, is he is essentially a kid. Right? He's afraid of needles. His major, like, thing that he has to deal with is that people don't take him seriously. And he wants people to take him seriously. He has, like, a kid's problem. Essentially. Basically, he's just had, like, a playful attitude. Like, there's a scene in this movie that perfectly encapsulates us. Where, uh, at the beginning, when he picks up the kids from, as you put it, baby jail. Mm -hmm. Uh, they put their hands around his eyes and say, guess who? Mm. While he's driving. Yeah. And this doesn't, like, he wants to play. He, like, wants to guess who it is and he keeps trying to figure it out while he's driving. And the yeah. fact that he's driving doesn't ever factor into his brain. And that just kind of, like, you know, makes it that he's a kid that just wants to hang around and play with kids uh, but also is trapped in the body of Ernest P. Worrell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, neither him nor the kids show any fear of death during this sequence where they're driving on the road and the guy driving the bus, his eyes are covered. That's not true. At a certain point, they're going to hit a truck and then they freak out. That's, that's, okay, yes. At the end, towards the end, they do freak out. They do ultimately lose the game of chicken. Now, here's my question about this sequence. Is this deliberate, like, foreshadowing? Is this setting up Ernest's character arc where he is initially, he's presented with a situation where he initially seems unafraid of death. And then he is afraid at the last moment. And then at the end of the movie, he plays a different, perhaps even more dangerous game of chicken that he doesn't lose. Is that deliberate, or are those two jokes just disconnected? Uh, I feel like you could see it either way. Uh, I choose to believe that it's deliberate, and put my faith in John Jerry the Third. Yeah, so this movie, but I don't, we didn't shout it out, but the director of this movie and almost every other Ernest movie is John R. Cherry the Third. Also, the TV show and yeah, perhaps the, some influence on the commercials. I think he was the director of the commercials too, but I don't, I didn't like look it up, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. Uh, he also co-wrote this movie with a dude named Coke Sam's, um, and that guy is the, I think, the only other person to direct an Ernest movie, because I'm pretty sure he directs 
Ernest Goes to School, which is the first straight-to-video Ernest movie. Or maybe the second? Don't remember. Uh, yeah. All so. right, so we uh, we talked about the low points a little bit. Do we want to get to the high points, or do we want to just get to the essentials? Well, you said your low point. I didn't get to say my... I mean, I guess I did say my... My low point is just the general cultural appropriation stuff with the Native Americans. The, a big thing in this movie is, like, the justification for the camp being there and the camp being a good thing, but it, the mine being bad is that, like, uh, the chief sees the mostly white, and I would have to assume mostly rich, campers as being, like, young braves who are going through their coming-of-age ceremony. And I think that feels icky. And it's, like, especially icky because the guy playing the chief is Iron Eyes Cody. And for anybody who doesn't know, Iron Eyes Cody is, like, a dude who had a long career uh, in Hollywood is playing Native American characters. He's, mo- I think, most famously the um, the crying Native American in, like, the litter PSA. You know what I'm talking about? With the single tear that's, like, parried in, like, everything. Uh, that's him. He is not a Native American. He's Italian. And so then he's he's playing this character and then, like, giving... That character is, like, giving permission to a bunch of white people to, like feel some sort of ownership over this, like, legacy that they have no part in. And I do really like, because it's so crazy, the um, the end sequence of the movie where Ernest becomes immune to bullets and, and perhaps all earthly weapons. But also, like, he gets, like, Native American superpowers. It's it's a little Iron Fist-y. Well, uh, let's jump jump back a little bit and kind of expand upon that so a big part of this movie is the ritual of the blade the stone and the arrow which yeah. as uh pictured in the flashback at the start of the movie is a ritual that young uh members of the kikiki tribe would go through uh where they'd have to be true they'd have to have true courage have faith in the great one and be pure of heart and if mm-hmm. that was the case no weapon a mortal man could touch them mm-hmm. so the weapon forged against pin, you shall prosper right so they will pin uh one of the tribesmen to a board they would throw a rock at them they'd throw a blade at them and then they'd shoot an arrow and even if you aimed as quickly as you could and had hawkeye or green arrow skill set uh you'd miss no matter what and that was the ritual which somehow Ernest takes on later like, in this movie and as the mining as the mining leader is just trying to straight up murder him with a gun he's, yeah he's shooting uh, a hunting rifle at him for uh performing guerrilla warfare on the work camp that <laughs> was taking apart the camp camp uh he is unable to shoot Ernest because Ernest is apparently an immortal god that has faith in the great one true courage and is pure of heart yeah, he's a, he's a unkillable warrior shaman by the end of the movie. Uh, but also he gets to be a camp counselor, so that's great. Uh, yeah, like, the sequence is literally the dude has the gun trained on Ernest. We get a shot, like a James Bond opening style shot, through the crosshairs, pointed at Ernest. And then he's firing the gun at Ernest, who's just dancing around, like, a couple of feet in front of him, in the middle of a green field. And not getting hit with any of the bullets. And then Ernest walks up and does like a fucking Bugs Bunny move. And puts his finger in the barrel. And like has a stare down with Mr. Crater. That's the name of the mining director. Larry Crater, I think is his full name. Uh, and then the, my favorite part of the sequence. <laughs> besides just the fact that, oh, Ernest is unkillable. Uh, which could, that could also be a, uh, the name of an Ernest movie. <laughs> is that the Len like... The attorney for Crater Industries is watching this and, like, mouths to himself, like, not today. Like, in triumph over seeing his evil boss defeated by this unkillable handyman. The best thing about the scene, and I think one of the best characteristics of Ernest that is uh, essential, in my mind, is that he is not, like, he's not 
he's inept. He's not great at doing things. But when something goes his way, no matter how small, he gets cocky immediately. Mm -hmm. So the first shot, Ernest is ducking and diving. The second shot, Ernest is like, huh, would you look at that? And by the third shot, Ernest is literally just like holding his chest out, not even dodging, saying, shoot me right here. And nothing happens. And then the cockiest guy ever walks up and puts his hand on the gun. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's great. That's a great character dynamic for Ernest. I think we're going to see that, I think, reach its zenith in uh, Slam Dunk Ernest, which will be a treat for, for later on for people. Because uh, that kind of dynamic sort of becomes the whole plot of that movie, uh, along with a bunch of other crazy shit. So, yeah. Ernest becomes unkillable. What were we doing? Where are we going? <laughs> Guide me through so, this podcast, Josh. We were talking about the low points. Uh, we could talk about the high points, and we can move on to the essentials. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's talk. About, let's do the high points, and then we'll do essentials. All right. So, so you just did me, the low points. For me, there was a uh, a few good jokes that were the pretty high points of this movie. Uh, that it's one, hard to really, pick one. Well, I can pick a couple. Uh, no, I'm saying it's hard to pick just one. Oh, sure. Uh, but one in particular made me uh, almost choke to death when I was watching. My co-host can mm-hmm. attest. Uh, yes. Where Ernest was instructing uh, the kids that he was taking on a hike uh, when they found a family of badgers. What not to do in front of badgers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a good bit. This is a really good bit. I'm already <laughs> laughing thinking about it. And then he just has this seizure that like starts off like a beginning of a Porky Pig speech where he's like, yip, 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 and then the badgers maul him, and it's great. Well, he sees the badger, and he goes, it's very important that when you see a badger, you don't go, yip, 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 and he just does it <laughs> in the badger's face. Uh, yeah, no, that's really good. I, I That's a good, that's a good joke. Uh, let's, do you have a, a high point to add to that, and then we'll go back and forth. Uh, sure. I think a real high point of this movie is uh, two characters that we haven't talked about at all. Because despite being major characters in the movie, they're pretty extraneous to the plot. Uh, and they are the two uh, camp chefs. So they're, they're like, they got kind of a, um, like a Laurel and Hardy thing going on. It's like a tall skinny guy and like a stout dude. And uh, they're really weird. They're kind of at odds tonally with the rest of the movie. And they're constantly doing this bit where they're horrible chefs who cook weird monstrosities and use things that are not food in their cooking. And they're desperately trying to recreate a recipe for a mythical food called Eggs Erroneous. <laughs> and they'll yes. like. The fabled Eggs Erroneous. Yeah, and there'll be like a part where they're talking. And somebody will say something, and they'll decide that that's the ingredient they need for eggs erroneous, and they'll start shouting at each other about it, and then they'll run off to make the eggs erroneous. There's a part where they're, like, forcing... The, Ernest shows up, and they're, like, they're friends with him. And he's, like, sad, and it's after some misfortune in the movie. And they tell him to eat some of the eggs erroneous or I, mean, it's, I, mean, I don't even think it is the eggs erroneous they just tell him to eat some of their awful no, it food it is the eggs erroneous oh it is the eggs erroneous okay yeah and they he doesn't want to do it and they're so committed to getting him to eat that they do this like for extended bit where they like restrain him and they're doing the like it, the airplane is coming into the hangar and they're like humming and it just the movie becomes completely fucking absurd every time these guys are on the screen so, um, one of my, like, favorite quotes happens in this scene, uh, from Ernest, which I think becomes an essential characteristic of him later on, uh, where I just off-quoted, like, as he's trying to, like, not eat this disgusting goop that they're trying to feed him, uh, he's like, I don't want to eat it, I can't eat on an empty stomach, which is like, what? You know? Like, that means you can never eat. Yeah. You like, have you to eats? have already eaten to eat. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I don't think, like, you, you don't, you know, like, that's such a deep sense that explains so much. Yeah, he also at one point says something like, the hungry wolf hunts best, which is another earnest thing where he has, like, lots of sayings. A lot of uh, folksy wisdom that he seemingly made up. Yeah, that um, maybe doesn't make a ton of sense when you 
think about it. Like, that's kind of like a recurring earnest bit. Uh, and those guys later on during the gorilla attack on the mining thing, the chefs come back. They have a machine they establish early on, uh, which, like, I don't, you put things in one end and it shoots out the other end as, like, food goop. Oop. Uh, one of the bits from that is they make uh, linguine Alfredo, where they shove in, like, uncooked linguine, and then a little chef doll named Fredo. Yeah, and the guy, the guy's doing, the the bigger dude is doing a voice for it. There's the part where they're making lobster bisque, and he's, like, lifting up lobsters and, like, making them talk to each other, and then th- callously throwing them into this machine that appears to be mostly made out of garbage cans. It's, this is, we, we mentioned before... Uh, we're, well, not on the podcast, but when we were watching it at one point, I brought up the Pee Wee Herman influence, or the Pee Wee's Big Adventure influence in specific, like, and their whole bit is very Pee Wee. Well, for sure, but also, this is another carryover from the Ernest TV show. Uh, mm-hmm. it turns out that these two characters are sort of an amalgamation of, like, other wacky characters that would show up played by the same dudes on, uh, the Ernest TV show, Haver. This is sort of like, um... Uh, Rich Fulcher in the Mighty Boosh, right? Where it's like, these guys are like in every episode, but they're not always playing the same characters. Right, or doing the same things. So mm. uh, in this particular instance at camp, they're just the chefs. Yeah. So they're a high point in the movie for me. Do you have another high point? I think they're kind of like a combination high point, low point. Uh, mm-hmm. Because good. at a certain point, like, especially during the gorilla scene, it's like, what is going on with these guys? Are they coordinated with Ernest? Are they just doing their own thing? Like, you yeah, they... kind of feel that they're so removed from the movie itself that you could literally cut those scenes out and the movie would not be that much different. Yeah, I really appreciate how weird they feel, like, tonally and stylistically compared to the rest of the movie. But I definitely think it's also maybe not necessarily a strength because you're right, like... They they don't need to be in the movie. The thing with them in the gorilla fight, what's especially weird, is there's a pretty long, like, building and preparing montage that they do not factor into at all. But then they just show up during the battle. Which then, which is why you and I have the question of, like, do, are they and Ernest working together? Because we don't see... Like, we get to see, like, the bullies come back, and they team up. Like, we get to see the prelude and to all that. the smart kid tells everybody where to go, but the chefs are not a part of that at all. Yeah, and then, very tragically, their uh, garbage can food in Goopinator, uh, that's not what they call in the movie. That, that's, no, that's, that's, that's the name, though. That's, that's my canon name. The, 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 uh, the heavy for... Crater Mining, the the Darth Vader of this movie, who is a, as far as I know, completely unnamed giant man with a beard, uh, destroys it with a bulldozer. I think he's like the foreman, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, but no, but I mean, like, yeah. Yes, he is the, his actual job is foreman. I'm just saying his, like, narrative function is that he's the heavy. Uh, Because he's the one, Ernest fights him at one point. He fights him at two points. Yes. Ernest gets into a physical fist fight with a man. Uh, and is roundly beaten while children watch him. This is correct. Uh, so I feel like that's like a high point, low point in the movie. Uh, but if we can get back to high points, uh, one of the biggest ones for me is Pokey, the turtle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. General concept. Ernest has so, a pet turtle. Is it? It's a, I believe an Eastern box turtle. Correct. I used to have uh, a, one or more of these as pets, uh, and it bites him on the nose. And the only way to get him to get off his nose is to sing him a song. Yes. Do you want to tell the people what song it is? Uh, I'll give you that honor. Shit. Well, I said that because I don't actually remember the name of the song. It's the, the Turtles that, one. That's why I gave it back to you. And no, it's not. Oh, no, it is the Turtle one. Uh, it's uh, You and Me Together, I think is a song. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, people know this. It's like in a million commercials. Uh, but it's by the Turtles. So I think it's a, just Happy Together. Happy Together. It's Happy Together is the name of the song. Happy Together by the Turtles. Uh, the, yeah, Ernest and the kids singing at one point. The pokey scene is funny, I think, throughout. Because it starts with Ernest confiding in the turtle. Because the kids don't like him or whatever. They're me- they were mean to him. I, I forget specifically what Sparks is. Because there's a bunch... They gave him poison ivy as a gift. Oh, 
Yeah, so that's this is after he gets beat up, yes? And they they to give him a they give him like a get well gift, but it's like a potted poison ivy that somehow they acquired without getting poison ivy themselves. Uh no, wait. This was this is not after he gets beat up. This is after he gets stung by a bunch of bees. No. Cuz he's got dots of stuff already all over his face when he gets the poison ivy. Huh. Yeah, you're right. No, you're right. Uh but anyway, they give him they prank him by giving him poison ivy and he's he's at a low point. He Ernest is at several low points throughout this movie. He's a very low status character. Uh and he's confiding in the turtle and then the turtle bites him on the nose and he specifically what I think is the funniest part of the scene is he goes you said you wouldn't do this again. <laughs> uh and then what's great about this is it comes back later on like this sets up another scene uh which is just as great where uh, they're doing their guerrilla attack against the mining encampment, like, working site. And they par- like they catapult in Pokey and some other eastern box turtles with parachutes uh, mm-hmm. to go and bite them on the heads and noses uh, to the th- tune of Happy Together by the Turtles in the background. But it's like a military march version. Right. And at one point, uh, there's, like, it's not Ernest doing it. It's literally like the camera pans to the turtles and somebody voices them and says, I'm scared, Sarge. Yeah, so which then is like, does that mean that Pokey really did tell Ernest he wouldn't bite him again and then betrayed him? Yeah, did that I happen? think Pokey can talk and it's just mm-hmm. not like a big part of the movie. Yeah. So when Ernest is his low point, he hasn't just been betrayed by the children. He's also been betrayed by the turtle. And you live by the turtle, you die by the turtle. Uh, all right. Uh, moving on from that, do you have any other high points? Uh, let me think. So we, we did... Just The turtle one is a pretty big one. I don't know if I have another high point. I do. Uh, I mean, actually, I have... I have two. Uh, well, mm-hmm. we have one we already talked about, so I'm not going to talk about it again because it's the the shooting scene, which is just insane. Um, yeah, that would have been a, one of my high points too if we hadn't had an extended discussion of it. So, but my final high point is when Ernest sings in this movie, where he's yeah. at his second and most lowest point, and has a solo that he sings to everybody being sad, but specifically him. Where uh, it's titled "Awfully Glad It's Raining." Yeah, the gist of which being, you know, so no one can see that he's crying. And it is a bummer song for. that also, like, is kind of great. Like, it, yeah, like it's a it's a mover. Like, you feel it. It's totally ridiculous because the movie is not been a musical up until this point. There's been there's been music because there's been montages and stuff with like pop songs. There's the happy together thing. Uh, but this is like a full on like there's the part where they sing happy together for Pokey to get him off of Ernest's nose. And that's just them singing, right? It's like it's totally like, it's like a it's like less than a minute scene. Yeah. This is a full musical number where Ernest is singing and also there's a, a non diegetic backing track. Uh, which comes out of nowhere. And also it's like kind of genuinely emotionally affecting like i don't know if it's because i already have like a ton i don't know if it's because i'm not gonna say i i'm gonna say we i don't know if it's because we already have a ton of pre-existing affection for the character of Ernest, uh or or if it's just because it's a, it is emotionally affecting but like you i, I really felt for him it really got me it it's got me effective, too effective musical scene yeah it made me feel for the guy uh yeah that's it. Yeah, that's definitely... I got another high point now that I think about it, too. Okay, let's do it. This will be our final high point. So there's a part uh, during the gorilla fight, after um, the foreman has destroyed the food and goopinator, and he's rampaging around, uh, trying to murder ch- children and Ernest with a bulldozer. Mm-hmm. Uh, where they... There's been this running gag throughout the movie where very early on, Ernest has, like, a golf cart that he uses in his duties as, like... I think he's the groundskeeper. I think that might be his actual job. Uh, but he loses control of it. And so sort of throughout the movie, there's, like, a background, literal running gag of, like, the the non-manned golf cart just sort of, like, zipping through the camp by itself. And then... 
at the end in the big fight at the with the miners uh they loaded up with explosives uh like molotov cocktails and stuff they just pull out like nowhere like they just you know they belong in baby jail because they know without instruction how to create a molotov cocktail yeah and they so they load up this cart with that and ernest does a kamikaze attack on the bulldozer don't worry, he gets out at just the right time. But also, don't worry, because he's unkillable and it wouldn't have mattered. Uh, but also, also, don't worry, because even though the cart seemingly explodes, later on we see it rolling around through the background. That's my high point, uh, is that the, the cart blows up and it's kind of like treated like it's sad, like this thing died. And then the payoff is it shows back up later it turns out it's as unkillable as Ernest, and it's, like, riding around in the background all, like, charred and blasted. And presumably will continue riding around all charred and blasted uh, until the landscape matches it. We can all hope and dream. <laughs> so that's my other high point, is the totally bonkers payoff to the go-kart uh, bit. Alright, I think we've covered all the high and low points of this movie. More high than low, which is good. Uh, but the low points are pretty staggering. Now, let's talk about the essentials. What makes an Ernest movie? What makes Ernest, Ernest? And if we were going to make our perfect pitch for an Ernest movie, what can we take away from this movie that we need to have? And uh, okay. I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Yeah, so I have a little list of things that I think are necessary for an Ernest movie. I think Ernest needs to be... Uh, low status, at least at the beginning of the movie. I think Ernest movie, an Ernest movie needs him to be working his way up. Uh, that he needs a goal to get to, that he wants to be something, has a lofty dream. Yeah, I think he needs, I, I the other thing is like, I think he needs a new job, and it, or he needs a job, well, we won't say new job because we haven't watched the other movies, but he needs to have an ambition. Mm -hmm. uh, he can't be contented, and he also can't be uh, really above anybody. For sure. He shouldn't start out in a supervisor position. No, no, no. no you, it, should, a movie should, it should never start with Ernest as the boss. Like I said, he needs to be low. I think Ernest needs to be low status, and he needs to have an ambition. Mm -hmm. um, I think the fourth wall breaking is important. Agreed. It's also like an intro-outro sort of thing, and I, I, I think it's a, a useful way to bring everybody into the story. Yeah. Uh, do you think it's an essential element that he team up with children? Well... Because we will see later on that that happens more than once. And that's the crux of this movie. I think it's the crux of Ernest. So I kind of already mentioned this, but, you know, he's a child at heart. He has that playful attitude. He's not great with adults and, like, people his age. But with kids, he can relate because he is a kid. And I think him, like, having that relationship with... Uh, either a group of kids or like a sidekick uh, is probably something that would be very important to have just as that basis to understanding that part of artist. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a pretty accurate assessment. Now, there's some stuff that I want to suppose as possible essentials. Like, we, we're operating with a lot of foreknowledge here. We have seen the shape of Ernest to come. And we're making a lot of our, our judgments currently based on that. But there's some stuff that I just want to present as elements from this movie that we can ponder whether or not maybe these should be essential to Ernest. Mm -hmm. Should he have to undergo the trial of the blade in every movie? Well, I think what is essential to Ernest, to me, is that there's something magical about that guy. Something that, like, you don't quite find everywhere. He's not an everyman. He is something. I mean, he is an everyman, sure, but he's also, like, the hero that we need. And perhaps is a hero of legend in some way, shape, or form. That when we dig deep into our own hearts, that we find out that maybe we should have disrespected Ernest, and maybe we should have taken his own charm into our daily lives. And I think that is an essential element. Okay, so I think you're getting at a couple of things here. Okay, so I'm going to assume what you're saying is, no, he doesn't need to undergo the trial of the blade in another movie. <laughs> I mean, not necessarily, uh, but maybe something akin Okay. The other things I think you're getting at here is a supernatural element mm -hmm. should be in, is a, is, is are we saying that's an essential? I mean, I thought it was one of the high points of this movie. 
Yeah, I think I dig it. I think our perfect Ernest movie should have some kind of supernatural element. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be like the same trial of the blade and what have you. In fact, it probably is better if we remove it from uh, the Native American ties. Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. perhaps we move on to something else magical or spiritual, but it should be included as an element. Uh, I think you're saying that Ernest should win? <laughs> well, sure, but not only, like, win through, you know, his hard work and or... perseverance, but win through something that we can't quite explain. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do you... So the other thing that it sounded like you were getting at, which I think is a really interesting idea, but that I don't know if I would ever have said on my own, should be an essential element of Ernest, which is, like, the weight of prophecy. <laughs> Do we want that? Should there be a weight of prophecy? Should there be... Should, should Ernest be moving towards a, a foreseen destiny? Let's table that for now. I think it's something mm -hmm. to keep on the back burner, and maybe it's something that could be a part of it, but for right now, I think let's just keep it baseline. Okay. I mean, I think there needs to be... Slapstick humor. Correct. Ernest is a creature that creates wanton destruction and has no grace. Yeah, I think a chaos maybe is a way we could put that. Mm -hmm. uh, there should be an element of chaos. Um, now, sh does Ernest need a love interest? In this movie, he kind of has a love interest, but not really. I would say he... at best, he has a platonic relationship with the nurse. And I don't I think, think he... there's any element of him being attracted to her that we can see he's definitely trying to impress her at a couple points in the movie i i think there's an implication that he maybe has a crush on her they don't kiss he doesn't get the girl at the end uh so i'm gonna say as far as we know right now that's not an essential element mm -hmm. so the list i have i have compiled currently is uh low status with ambition mm -hmm. slapstick humor fourth wall breaking supernatural element the weight of prophecy, vindication, and chaos. Uh, I think there's like more specific things that we can get into. Uh, Tell me what they are. I think, first and foremost, we have to talk about how Ernest needs to take a lot of punishment. I mean, of course there's chaos that he creates. But in essence, Ernest himself has to go through the trials and tribulations of being beat up a lot before he can receive vindication. Whether that is being mauled by badgers, being shoved in the face with poison ivy, or simply being unable to create the perfect barbecue machine, Ernest must be beat up. Okay, I have... I'm writing, what I'm writing down for as an essential element is that Ernest must suffer both physically and emotionally. <laughs> Yes. Uh, specifically, uh, we have to include how he has a head and possibly hat of stone. There's one memorable scene in this movie where someone th hits him with a tray to the face, like a plastic cafeteria tray. And there's a cartoon outline of his face and hat brim pointed out in it, which is uh, something. Yeah, but then they hit him. He's stuck in the tray. And then they hit him with a, a cast iron skillet, uh, which frees him, and that bends the brim of his hat. Mm -hmm. But then he bends it back into place. Uh, is Ernest a cartoon character? Is that what we're getting at here? Uh, there should be some cartoon elements regarding the punishment, so he should cartoon. get physically beat up, but uh, like he's fine. A, a good running joke of this movie is that whenever something happens to Ernest, and Ernest alone... They joke that no one has gotten hurt. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, so that's... Do you, do you want to... Hmm. How do we word that? Uh, cartoon violence? Cartoon violence. Yeah, cartoon violence is a good way. Because that implies that, like, element of, like... Well, you know, we're not going to see someone get maimed yeah, in an Ernest movie. Totally, but we're going to see Ernest have some mishaps and maybe need bandages. Yeah, like, Ernest can get hit by a truck, but as long as he gets up. But he's not going to, like, get his hand chopped off. Another uh, specific, very specific uh, trait about Ernest that I think, because of how well it worked in this movie, should be included, is that he can't eat. Uh, I don't know 
why <laughs> to play. Wait, what? <laughs> but he either has to be force fed food. He can't eat unless he is not on an empty stomach. And uh, he's never tasted quiche, which is a big quote of this movie uh, that he said more than once. Uh, so he's bragging about being manly. He 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 says that he's never eaten quiche. I don't know if we're to take him at his word, though. Listen, I am very manly, and I've baked and eaten a lot of quiche in my life. So I don't know. Well, there was a there was a book called "Real Men Don't Eat Quiche." Mm. I don't know anything about it except for the title. Sounds like a bad but that book. was a thing that existed. It's probably a bad book. Yes. Uh, but I don't, there seemed to be a running theme in this movie about that, and I thought it was something that I enjoyed, so I wanted to keep it in my thoughts. But if you don't think it's essential, then we can talk about that. Here's the thing. I think this should be a living... I, the, the list I'm making of the essential earnest elements should, like the Constitution, be a living document. <laughs> and I think I'm perfectly willing to put down can't eat specifically quiche. And then later on, modify or remove it if we acquire some conflicting knowledge vis-a-vis Ernest's uh, gustatory capabilities. <laughs> Fair. Um, and I had more... What if he eats a quiche? Well, maybe he builds up to eating a quiche. Like, later movies that we haven't seen yet, he eats a quiche. Quiche is good. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a really great illustration of how toxic man- masculinity hurts even men. That it would prevent someone like Ernest from enjoying quiche. Mm-hmm. I think that's tragic that he's never tasted a quiche. You know what else was tragic? Uh, what? Ernest was in Nam. I was gonna bring that up. <laughs> Ernest references being in Nam. There's a part where they're hiking through the woods and he brings up Nam. Which then also, it's like when he is constructing. Uh, the the mechanisms of his guerrilla war on the mining company, like he is essentially fighting his uh, the war in reverse. He has become the insurgent. It's like Ernest basically has the same plot as Rambo. <laughs> I mean, they do call him Rambo at some point in this movie. They do and. Also, uh, he transforms his bus into this gorilla catapult thing, uh, and then he, when is asked by the sensible nurse to, you know, not do the thing he's doing, he's like, they will not take this camp. He just says that with, like, to- a totally, like, straight face. It's the most serious he's been in the movie. And then he's really good at giving commands, like a soldier. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't have any compunction about using child's <laughs> So I think what we need to put in the essentials is uh, war background, perhaps brainwashed. Uh, sure. War, like, maybe our perfect Ernest movie, and I, this is a jo- I will confess that this is a joke that I made while we were watching the movie. But maybe our perfect Ernest movie is, like, Ernest Born. Not like the Born Identity, but like Punisher Born, the Punisher comic that's about him being in Vietnam. Another thing to add to the list. Keep it in mind. Yeah. I mean, there's not, it's not like there isn't, well, never mind, there's really only one. I was going to say, it's not like there isn't precedent for making a Vietnam comedy, a Vietnamity, but it's really just Good Morning Vietnam. MASH is about Korea, right? No, they're not in Vietnam in that. Mm-mm. So, in addition, uh, I want to go back to chaos for a second, because there are uh, certain things involved in chaos that I think should be included that were high points of this movie. Um, in particular, how animals and machines act in the movies like they have their yeah. own sort of um sentience sentience and that you know they are allies of Ernest, but also don't always do what they want he wants them to do mm-hmm. so machines and animals are sentient well animals are they respect but already. do not but do not no they they will hmm I mean, just in general. What is it? Well, they're, they're, machines and animals are sentient and have a complicated relationship with Ernest? Is that how we're going to word this? I, I think that's the way it needs to be. Like, they're just like, Ernest has a complicated relationship with animals and machines within his vicinity. 
Okay. They uh, either, they both help and hurt him. <laughs> sure. I mean, that makes sense. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then there's also, uh, we gotta talk about his catchphrases, but uh, do you want to pick anything else off your list before I go off mine? Hmm. Uh, I was gonna bring up his catchphrases, but I think that's good. Was there anything... No, that's oh, uh, class struggle. Yes. I mean, yeah, we just want to put down class because that's the core of this movie. He's fighting a rich businessman. Yeah, he's like just there's some kind of class struggle he gets involved in, uh, and at a certain point, he, uh, I mean, whether or not he like purposely gets involved in it, whether it's like accidental or just you know something's going on, uh, and then also he's complicit in the class struggle by accident. Because he's easily bamboozled. Maybe you just write down easily bamboozled. Uh, sure. Uh, but I also want to say that uh, the history of all here to existing Ernest is the history of class struggles, as said by Karl Marx. Yep. Don't look it up. Easily bamboozled. Or are we going to talk? We're going to talk about catchphrases now. Yes. Uh, so he is from this movie. Three main catchphrases. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first and foremost, know what I mean. Yes. And uh, secondly, e- uh, 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 with his eyes moving. Uh, and he has to do something like that is either seen as gross or he deals with something gross and makes that face. Uh, yeah, and I, then... think, I think the main point where he... Oh, that was another crazy thing that we didn't talk about. They make a toilet into a bomb and he looks in the toilet before they fling it at the mine and he goes does the ew uh implying that the bomb toilet still has poop in it so that happens in this movie i don't know what to make of that but that's a that's an element <laughs> of this movie i don't think that's an element of Ernest as a whole but there definitely needs to be some gross joke where he makes that face uh yeah. and then his final catchphrase which is not as uh big but is something he repeatedly does throughout this movie is distract people by saying, is that a rabbit? And then ro- running away. That's a good running gag in this. He does it a couple times. And it's it's pretty funny every time it happens. Yep, and then we find out that rabbit is the missing ingredient for eggs erroneous. Yeah, he does the, is that a rabbit, to the chefs. And the chef goes, rabbit, rabbit, we need rabbit. <laughs> this is pretty funny. So that's his basic catchphrases. And then he has a couple other mannerisms that we should definitely make note of. Sure, what do you got? So, Ernest is a man of the word. Whether or not he read this somewhere, heard it somewhere, or just plain made it up, he has this folksy, smarmy language to him, where he just makes up classic lines that you should not put too much thought into, and definitely just agree with and move forward from, such as, One monkey don't stop no show. There's other examples throughout this movie, but that was the one that I wrote down. Uh, I'm going to put that down as folksy wisdom, but then put quotes around wisdom. Yeah, folksy something. Folksy Uh, wisdom, you know? Yep. You know what I mean? I I do. (laughs) Uh, Ernest is easily distracted, whatever he's doing. If you, like, say, hey, Ernest, he'll get distracted and something will happen. Uh, He's also weirdly distracted by fire. Where he can't just light a match and use it. He has to stare at the match until it goes out for some reason. Uh, yeah, he gets, like, entranced by the flame. That's, like, a running gag in this. It happens uh, when they're setting up the toilet bomb. Correct. Uh, in addition to a couple other points throughout the movie. Uh, Ernest is bad at math, with money, and languages. But he considers himself real good at it. Yeah, uh, for sure. Oh, how do we want to... How do we put that? Overconfident? Yeah, overconfident. I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, but will ultimately lose, like, immediately. Mm. Ernest, in general, is a man of arts and crafts. Uh, mm-hmm. I, whether it's turning a bus into a catapult, or creating a barbecue machine to cook a couple hot dogs and a whole rotisserie chicken, uh, he built- likes to whip things up that probably won't work. Yeah, he builds, at one point in this movie, he builds a gasoline-powered machine to rotisserie cook two whole chickens and, like, four hot dogs. And then 
gets like caught up in the machine and is almost burned by it or is burned mm-hmm. by it. Uh, I'm going to put craftsman down as an essential element for Ernest. Uh, you should put that in quotes. I'm going to put crafts in quotes, but not man. Fair. He he is a man who's never tasted quiche. There definitely needs to be an element of self-sacrifice for Ernest. Yeah, Ernest is a self-sacrificing hero. I mean, he's willing to chance getting shot to save the camp. And my final note, which is something we kind of already covered, uh, but is worth mentioning, is that he is easily cocky if given some luck. Mm-hmm. Mm. You give him one winning hand, and he'll claim he's the master of poker. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's he kind of is like... He kind of assumes he'll be good at anything he's about to do. Mm-hmm. Like, and then he's not good at anything. Except for apparently building improvised war weapons. But also, if you try to shoot him and you miss, he'll make it easier for you to shoot him next time. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, confidence that it is easy come and easy go. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, cool. Do you got anything else? That's all I got. Uh, do you have anything else for the essentials of Ernest? Uh, he wears a hat, and he wears a vest. Those are important. I think that's pretty much it. All righty, then. I mean, we got a lot. There's a lot of elements here. We're really starting to paint a portrait of what Ernest is and what an Ernest movie is. For sure, and I think we got a lot to go on that'll lead us into the next great beyond of Ernest movies and how we will make that the perfect pitch of an Ernest movie. So, with that being said, um, we have uh, talked about high and low points. What is the best point of this movie in your mind? And what's the best point of this movie in my mind? I think the single best point, you know what? I, 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 I didn't think this was going to be my pitch, and I am kind of stealing one of yours. But it How really, dare you. just thinking about it made me laugh so much that I think the single highest point of this movie is the part where he yells in that badger's face. That is something I was going to say. Uh, but since you took that from me, I will choose my best bit to be the Turtle Troopers, where parachuting box turtles come in to a marching beat drum of... Happy together by the turtles. All right. Well, uh, but we we can't just you know each have one and ha- not be a like complete one. You know, you and I we'd fight to the death over this. We, what we really need is another deciding factor. We are of course going to consult our guest who's been here the whole time. Don't look that up. The one and only. Drum roll, please. Wheel Diamond. Oh. Uh, What do you think, Wheel? And the wheel says... The turtle part. Ha-ha! Suck it, Nate. You've betrayed me, Wheel, but I still love you. And you can stay on the show. Shouldn't we also decide what the lowest low point is? Oh. Yeah, sure, we could do that. Uh, I mean, I think it's the... The cultural appropriation. I don't know. If we, I don't know if we need to consult Wheel on this one. No, I don't think we do. I think that wins. The I am Joseph Mangolo thing is like a one-off thing that just could easily be forgotten. But the cultural appropriation exists throughout the movie. All right. Yes. Now let's talk about the next movie. All right. So the next movie in chronological order is Ernest Saves Christmas. Yes. He goes right from going to camp to. Saving to Christmas. He's moving on up in the world. Uh, yeah, I think that's going to be interesting. It's going to be pretty different from this one. So I think it's going to have a lot of impact on our essentials list. Well, I can't say from experience, but I'm pretty sure this movie's going to blow our minds. You can't or can? I can't. I thought we will. Did we not watch it together? No, we did. I have, I have uh, selective amnesia. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. of course. I definitely knew that. Uh, after that incident on the set of A Talking Cat. For sure. Uh, all right. So, listeners, until next time, remember, there's a right and wrong in the universe, and the distinction is not hard to make. You know what I mean? Goodbye, everybody. Dolly, you burn. But now you gotta move, burn. 